Good morning. Uh, we want to uh, uh, express our uh, gratitude uh, to uh, the congregation of uh, Gethsemane uh, Church, who uh, really gave of uh, their time uh, yesterday to uh, work on the, the building and, and, and grounds. And uh, what a uh, what a wonderful uh, what a wonderful act of service! It just looks wonderful. Uh, they did repairs uh, that we uh, weren't expecting. It was uh, uh, just uh, beautiful all around. So uh, we're just uh, really thankful for the brethren uh, from our fellow congregation. And uh, it just uh, may the Lord continue to, uh, to bless them as they uh, have uh, certainly blessed us with their kindness, uh, with their service, and, and that sacrifice. Really uh, deeply appreciate that. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we thank you for uh, this morning. Uh, we thank you for gathering us together uh, as an assembly of believers. We uh, just want to glorify and honor your name today. Uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, through uh, the, uh, the teaching, the study of your word, Lord, this morning, that we would be drawn closer to you. Uh, even in uh, these uh, challenging uh, portions of uh, scripture, uh, we can be drawn ever nearer to you. We seek to know more of you and uh, pray that our relationship with you would uh, be much richer and deeper and more intimate than before. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your compassion and your kindness. We thank you for your amazing grace and that astounding mercy uh, that you shower upon us, Lord. Uh, we thank you for your word and that it's truth. And we thank you, Lord, that we can always, always hold on to the promises. Uh, your word never fails. You never fail. And you are unmoved, unshaken uh, by the things of this world that, that stir us and, and move us and make us tremble and and sometimes even fall, but, but not you, Lord. You pick us up, you give us strength, you give us courage, you give us boldness uh, to continue. 
and uh, we thank you for it. Uh, may your hand be upon us this morning as we uh, study your word. May your spirit guide us through uh, this study this morning, Lord, and uh, we continue to ask uh, that your hand of uh, love and healing uh, would be upon our community. Uh, be near to those who are grieving. Uh, be near to those who are seeking strength and comfort and rest and joy. You are the provider of all those things and so much more. Uh, there's no better arms to find rest in than yours. There's no better hands to be in than yours because you are mighty and you are above all things. And you are truth. You are light, you are hope, you are love. And uh, we, uh, we pray that our community and our church all would be continually uh, transformed by that love. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. And, uh, you know, we're uh, continuing uh, uh, in the, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we've been here for uh, quite some time. Uh, you know that we're... Uh, quickly uh, approaching uh, Easter, but we uh, finished uh, Mark chapter 12 uh, last week. It was a, a marathon of, so of sorts with all the verses, uh, and uh, we find ourselves in Mark uh, chapter 13 uh, this morning, a, a rather difficult uh, portion of uh, scripture, and I already uh, talked to Pastor Alex in the back, and I I said, you know, if he sees me start to wave or start to falter in any way, I might call upon him uh, to come up and, and, and help me, uh, but uh, we, will, we will do our very best. Uh, so uh, the events uh, of this portion, Mark chapter 13, uh, they likely took place in the middle uh, of the last week of the Lord Jesus, and so this, this whole chapter is really encompassing for us uh, the teaching of the Lord Jesus concerning his second coming. And uh, you can certainly read uh, this discourse in a more elongated form uh, in Matthew chapter 24 uh, and Matthew chapter 25, as well as Luke chapter 21. Uh, but you'll remember that Mark was writing to uh, Roman Gentiles without that Jewish background. So he wanted them to understand that biblical prophecy and specifically the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is really rooted in depth in that Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew prophecies of the Old Testament. So you might remember that the Lord Jesus had spent some time in the vicinity of the temple area, and as we saw last week, that's where the Sanhedrin had, had been questioning him. And so in that context, we're moving out of the temple and out to the Mount of Olives. And Mark chapter 13, verse 1 says, As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. And so this uh, particular disciple was just awestruck at the magnificent architecture and structure of this temple. Uh, and this temple had not yet uh, been finished at this point in history. Uh, the building of this temple, uh, which was known as uh, Herod's Temple, uh, was based on Zerubbabel's temple, and it wasn't finished until uh, A.D. 64. Uh, so there are 30 or so uh, years still left of uh, the building of the temple. And, and yet at this point, it was so magnificent in its structure that it drew from this disciple awe and, and wonder. Uh, if we're looking, and this is not biblical, but if we look at the writings of uh, Josephus, uh, the Jewish uh, historian, uh, according to his records, there was gold plating on this temple on every side, uh, so much so uh, that when the sun rose in the morning and you looked at the temple, you could get uh, blinded uh, by the reflection. And uh, uh, according to those uh, records of the historian, it was also made of limestone bricks. It's recorded that strangers uh, approaching the, the holy city of Jerusalem as they looked and saw the temple, they thought it looked like a snow-capped mountain. Uh, take that for what it is. Uh, that's, not, that's, that's outside of the, the word of God. But 
Uh, but you can imagine the, the word, uh, you know, just the wonder and just the, the magnificence of this sight. And this disciple is turning the attention of the Lord Jesus to the temple. And so in verse 2 of Mark chapter 13, the Lord Jesus makes a prediction in relation to the temple. He replied to the disciple, do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And, and of course, in A.D. 70, uh, the Romans came in with all their armies and uh, they destroyed this very temple. And actually, the whole city of Jerusalem. Uh, and when the Lord Jesus went into the temple, you remember in our studies these weeks, and he, he drove out the, the money changers and the dove sellers, and when he cursed the fig tree, and now as he predicts the destruction of the temple, he was really signifying that, that empty religion is just worthless to him. It is. You know, there's consequences, as we talked about last week, for suppressing the truth of God. So this prediction about the temple, it really prompted more questions from the disciples in verses 3 and 4. Uh, it says in verse 3 of Mark chapter 13, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're all about to be fulfilled? And, uh, of course, we know uh, from uh, the records of Matthew and Luke that the disciples actually asked more uh, than when the temple would be destroyed. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, the disciples also asked Jesus, What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So, you know, they're not just asking him when the temple will be destroyed, but they're also asking him about his return, when it will be, and what the signs will be of his coming. So it, it appears that in the minds of the disciples, the destruction of the temple coincided with the end of the age and his return. So the verses that follow are Jesus' answers to both uh, these questions. So as you uh, look and uh, we read this portion of scripture, we see that some of these predictions refer to uh, the destruction of the temple uh, back in A.D. 70, but you'll also find that these prophecies go much farther into the future to the events preceding the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Um, if you want a complete picture of the whole Olivet Discourse uh, and the predictions, then uh, you, know, you certainly want to look at the three Gospels, Mark and uh, and Matthew and Luke uh, in regard to this, uh, they should be studied. Uh, we don't, of course, have time. Well, actually, according to that clock, you know, maybe we do have time this morning, right? And maybe I can take some extra time. I don't know. Uh, you know, I, someone fixed that. Who did that? Uh, before I had some time, you know, but we'll certainly, uh, even though we don't have time for that, we'll add some information from the other gospel writers as, uh, as we go through Mark's account. So uh, before Jesus answers what the disciples had actually asked, he gives them some characteristics of the present age in which they were living, and he tells them uh, of things that are not signs of the end of the age and his return. In verses 5 through 7 of Mark chapter 13, he says, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. So the Lord Jesus wanted these Jews to know that, you know, every time a false Christ or a false Messiah arises, or maybe even there's a war somewhere, they're not to conclude that that's the end of time and that Jesus will come soon. You know, Jesus was warning these disciples, yes, this is going to happen. It's going to happen more and more, but don't conclude that this is the end and that I'm coming soon. This is going to happen in your time, he tells them. And, of course, it's happening in our time. You know, he, also, you know, he mentioned wars and, uh, and rumors of wars, and what he was telling them is, yes, there will be uh, local wars, there will be local uprisings, and when those wars arise, it's not necessarily significant, not necessarily pointing to the fact that this is the end. 
He's saying these things will happen, but do not be alarmed. So uh, then what will be the signs of the end? Well, look at verse 8 of Mark chapter 13, and Jesus begins to explain uh, to his disciples. Verse 8, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. And Luke uh, added uh, in Luke chapter 21, uh, verse 11, Luke adds that there will be pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. So I think what Jesus is saying is that this is the start of the process of the end of the age, which will bring my return, he's saying. You know, th this is the pain. This is the pain that's necessary to introduce something new. Is, you know, Jesus said these would be signs of the end of the age. These would be signs uh, of his second coming. In Luke chapter 21, uh, the beginning of verse 12, and, uh, and I, I do want to make note, uh, you know, uh, Rebecca is back there in the booth this morning, so uh, thank you for all this because I am really all over the place this morning. Uh, you know, I am, I'm jumping here and there and everywhere, so that's quite a, uh, yeah, quite a baptism for you as you <laughs> go through that back there. But thank you for, for doing that. Uh, so the beginning of verse 12 uh, of Luke chapter 21, Jesus again, he addresses his present time with the disciples and he says, but before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. Uh, in Mark chapter 13, verses 9 through 13, he gives the disciples uh, a list of things that they'll experience and of course uh, what they must be ready for. He says, uh, beginning in verse 9, you must be on your guard. You'll be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues on account of me. You will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at that time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And uh, certainly, uh, friends, all you need to do, uh, if you're uh, familiar or if you have not read the Acts of the uh, Apostles in some time, go back, look through the Acts of the Apostles, and you'll see that all of this was fulfilled in, in the life of the Apostles uh, in the early church. Uh, and I think, I think the Lord was interjecting here, just preparing the apostles for what they should expect, what they must expect, uh, to teach them not to expect the end of the age too soon, not to expect the tribulation too soon, and the second coming uh, to the Mount of Olives too soon. So uh, Jesus now turns to uh, answer the question that they've asked about the end of the age. So in verses 14 through 23 of Mark chapter 13, he speaks about what we know as the great tribulation uh, that will lead up to his second coming. And um, when I'm speaking of his uh, second coming, I'm not talking about, uh, I don't want to confuse it, I'm not talking about the rapture uh, when Jesus returns in the clouds uh, to remove all the believers uh, from the earth before God's wrath. Um, if you want to read about that, you can read about that in uh, First Thessalonians uh, chapter 4 and in First Corinthians uh, chapter 15 and Titus chapter 2 and, and several other scriptures. But, uh, but what we're talking about is the Lord Jesus coming to the Mount of Olives to bring the tribulation to an end and to judge the world and to defeat the Antichrist and his evil world empire and then reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. That's what we're referring to. I hope that makes some sense. If not, uh, Pastor Alex is here. <laughs> I'll, I'll refer to my brother. But in Mark chapter 13, verse 19, uh, Jesus says, um, and Mark chapter 13, 19, those will be days of distress unequal from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. Uh, this, is what, uh, this is what the prophet Jeremiah called a, a time of trouble 
for Jacob. You know, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. So uh, that time of trouble for Jacob, Jacob being Israel, right? The people of God, the chosen generation in the Old Testament, it's their time of trouble or tribulation, right? It's also described as a time of, of wrath, of just unprecedented uh, indignation and, and punishment upon this world. Uh, back in Daniel chapter 9, it's spoken of as Daniel's 70th week. Uh, I would encourage you to look at uh, Daniel chapter 9 and read through it. Uh, his 70th week, the 77s, it should be understood as 70 weeks of years. Uh, in other words, a period of 490 years. And so the prophecy of, of the 70 weeks, <laughs> the prophecy of the 70 weeks is incredibly complex. I'm just, I'm not going it, to, it's, it's just amazingly detailed. But, you know, and, and really, there's several interpretations. But, but the 77s, of those 77s, 69 have been fulfilled. It's generally agreed upon uh, in history. And that would leave one more seven yet to be fulfilled. And it's thought that that final seven is the tribulation period on the earth just before Jesus comes to the earth. That will last seven years. So in Mark chapter 13, from verse 14 on, Jesus gives an overview of that second half of that seven-year tribulation period. In other words, the last three and a half years. Uh, Matthew and Luke, however, and I encourage you to uh, read those chapters that I mentioned earlier, Matthew and Luke will give you a whole overview uh, of that seven-year period. So uh, anyway, three and a half years into this tribulation period, we read that when you see, uh, verse 14, Mark chapter 13, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So uh, this is the abomination that causes desolation that Daniel it's spoken of by Daniel the prophet back in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And it's referring to this uh, idolatrous pollution uh, of the Jewish temples by the, by the Gentiles. This is something, you know, when you think of an abomination, it's something that causes disgust or, or, or hatred. A desolation just brings emptiness. I mean, it's just, it, this is horrible. They'll come into the temple. They'll come into the holy sacred place of God's people, and they'll desecrate it. Now, uh, the temple was defiled uh, in uh, 167 B.C. by, an, uh, by uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, who really set up an altar to Zeus over the altar of burnt offerings uh, in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Uh, and it was known as an abomination of desolation. Uh, and he did, uh, he did several things. Uh, you know, he, he tortured, he, he killed, he enslaved, um, you know, sacrificed pigs upon the altar, uh, uh, even forced the Jews uh, to eat uh, those that were animals that were considered unclean. But uh, it was an abomination. Uh, but Jesus here is speaking uh, some 200 years after this, that event, so Jesus was prophesying about a future event. So for the benefit of his Roman Gentile readers, you can see those words that Mark inserts there, right? Let the reader understand. Uh, it's just, it tells you once again how inspired these writers are by the Holy Spirit. It's really an incredible thing. So Jesus is clearly referring to a future abomination that causes desolation still to be uh, even in our time. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Daniel 9, 27 says that he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he'll set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So Antiochus, he, he didn't confirm a covenant with Israel for seven years. Uh, it's the Antichrist who in the end times, he is going to establish a 
covenant with Israel for seven years and then break it by doing something similar to the abomination of desolation uh, in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verses 3 and 4 says, uh, Let no one in any way deceive or entrap you, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first, that is the great rebellion, the abandonment of the faith by professed Christians, reading from the Amplified. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, that is the Antichrist, the one who's destined to be destroyed, who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and so insolently above every so-called God or object of worship so that he actually enters and takes his seat in the temple of God, publicly proclaiming that he himself is God, concluding in uh, verse 4 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Again, that was reading from the Amplified. So halfway through the seven years is going to be the Antichrist setting himself up in the Jewish temple to be worshipped as God. Uh, Revelation chapter 13 verse 14 tells us that there's going to be an image of the beast. There's going to be an image of the Antichrist that's set up in the temple of God. The false prophet is, the Bible says, by supernatural power going to give that image the appearance of life. And he'll demand to be worshipped. And that's the act of desolation of the temple. The abomination uh, that causes desolation. Halfway through the seven year period, that's going to be the signal for the Jews to flee Jerusalem. Looking back at Mark chapter 13, uh, verses 15 through 18. Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 15. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter. Uh, so uh, that, that warning not to re-enter the house for any possessions, that really underlines that point of urgency. Uh, you know, for those who depended on their cloaks for, for warmth uh, at night, the loss of their cloak, it represented a very serious difficulty. You know, the difficulties of, of, of you know, bearing or nursing a child under these circumstances is uh, really obvious. Um, and winter would just bring colder nights and rain and sometimes uh, even snow in the mountains. So the flight of the Jews here, it's also uh, prophesied in Revelation chapter 12, uh, verses 13 and 14. Revelation 12 beginning in verse 13. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times and half a time, out of the serpent's reach. The dragon is Satan. Uh, we understand. And I think the woman there is Israel, and the male child is Christ. And Israel was given wings to take flight to the mountains, nourished for a time, times, and half a time. So if you have time, times, and half a time, that's three and a half years. Right? So from, and, and it's that time that from the presence of, of the serpent. So the abomination that causes desolation is a sign that Jesus is coming soon. It's a sign, as Mark says, for the Jews to flee. Mark chapter 13, verse 20, says, If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. Um, that might refer to the uh, limited period uh, surrounding the destruction of the temple or even to a similar uh, period before the second coming. It may refer to both, I don't know. Uh, but uh, verses 21 through 23 of Mark chapter 13. Uh, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. 
So Jesus is saying to the chosen people, Israel, that they're not to believe during this period any Messiah that's arisen secretly, right? Jesus at that point will not come secretly. For when he comes, as Re you know, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 says, every eye will see him. Every eye will see him. So even if signs and wonders accompany such false prophets and, and false messiahs, what does Jesus say? They are not to believe. They are not to believe. Going back to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 says the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. So, you know, as we come closer and closer to the second coming uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, look, there's going to be miraculous deeds that are done in the name of false gods and false religions that will deceive many. The deception will be strong. The miracles will seem real, and the intent will be to mislead everyone, even as Mark says, you know, uh, you know including the elect. However, uh, you look at those words, even if possible, the elect, and of course, um, those whom God chooses. You know, if, if, let me say it like this. If it's God's choice, uh, then it cannot be undone. So there'll be no one who is elect who will be, you know, deceived to such an extent that they would lose their salvation. It's not that way. I want to, you know, I want to give you some encouragement, at least there. You know, God's grace will absolutely prevail. His chosen ones are not going to be drawn away into deception. You know, there's, there's a day uh, that's coming when someone will do signs and someone will do wonders that are just, you know, that have been, you know, uh, unsurpassed in reference to what the world's already seen apart from Christ Jesus our Lord. But uh, the Lord is saying here to, to watch out. Watch out. Be on your guard. Because when miracles are severed from the truth of God, then they're, they're not from the Holy Spirit, uh, but they're of a false spirit. You know, uh, we don't in any way want to be drawn away, even for a time, from the truth, right? And uh, we certainly want to be watchful and on guard. Uh, so now a sign of Jesus' return is found in verses 24 and 25 of Mark chapter 13. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. So uh, following the uh, great distress, there'll be utter blackness, darkness. But why? Well, you know, this, the darkness is just going to be a backdrop for Jesus returning is what we find verses 26 and 27 says that at that time people will see the son of man coming in the clouds with great power and glory and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens so the, the great glory that he's coming with is that glory of God that dwelt there in the tabernacle the temple and at Pentecost and on all sorts of various other occasions that light of God's presence will precede Jesus' coming. And that'll be the sign that Jesus is just there at the threshold of the door. In Zechariah uh, chapter 12, he told the Jews that he wouldn't come again until they asked for him. In Zechariah chapter 12, and then again in, um, in Zechariah chapter 14, we find that Jerusalem will be surrounded at this last point in the tribulation period by the armies of the world and they'll be almost obliterated and then they'll cry out to the Messiah that they rejected and he will come he will come now now the Lord Jesus at, at this point in the Olivet Discourse he didn't want his disciples to be taken up with all of the signs and not live up to the responsibilities and you know that's not the result he wants for, for us here this morning either for all of us to just be caught up with the signs and just forget our responsibilities as believers, as those whom he's called, you know, for a purpose. 
the Holy Spirit's intention in, uh, in giving us as a church uh, prophetic truth is, you know, that it always has, always, always has a practical application, always. You know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't given to gratify or to even satisfy our, uh, our curiosity. And we can certainly be curious about these things. You know, but rather uh, these things were given to just, you know, inspire and, and engender holiness of life and, and watchfulness as we look for the Savior who will come for those who believe in him. If we see the signs, you know, but we don't see him, well, that's, that's a problem, right? We need to see him. Our eyes need to be on him. So in order that they don't make the mistake of, of getting really caught up with the future and doing absolutely nothing in their lives presently toward holiness and godliness, what does he do? But he ends with two parables. You know, Matthew actually records um, three more parables than Mark does, but we won't deal with those this morning <laughs> as, uh, as I look at the time. We could. Uh, but we won't. <laughs> I thought about it. The first, though, is that uh, we'll, we'll stick to Mark this morning. The first is the parable of the fig tree uh, in verses 28 through 31 of Mark chapter 13. Jesus says, beginning verse 28, Now uh, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it's near. Right at the door, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Amen. You know, he's, he's saying, you know, just, just as a fig tree, you know, just as a fig tree's leaves just show what season it is, when you see these signs taking place, you'll know that my return is near. And you have to remember that he's speaking uh, in the context of the tribulation, of that seven-year tribulation. And the sign that he gave in verse 14 is that, so midway through that, uh, the tribulation, this abomination that causes desolation will happen. And those who are there who believe during this period, when they see this happen in Jerusalem, are, are, are not only to flee, but they're to count down from that moment, three and a half years, to know that Jesus is not very far away. You know, they'll be, they'll be given help to endure. Uh, you know, that's, that's encouraging. You know, you look again at, at verse 30 uh, of our text this morning. Truly, I tell you, uh, this generation will certainly not pass away until these things have happened. What generation? Well, I think it's the generation who sees this abomination uh, of desolation there in verse 14. This generation who that sees you, this will be there three and a half years away from the coming of Jesus Christ. Um, Daniel, going back, uh, we're, we're, almost, we're almost done. Daniel chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse 11. Uh, Daniel chapter 12. Uh, verses 11 and 12, uh, reading from the Amplified uh, again. From the time that the regular sacrifice, that is the daily burnt offering, is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up, ruining the temple for worship of the true God, there will be 1,290 days. How blessed, that is, how happy, how fortunate, how spiritually prosperous and beloved is he who waits expectantly, enduring, without wavering for the period of tribulation, and comes to the 1,335 days. So, you know, of course, you know, we need to remember that this abomination of desolation performed by the Antichrist is, uh, you know, in order to exterminate. The Jewish race. And Mark actually used this word generation speaking of the Jews in his gospel. And Jesus used it of the Jewish people. So it could mean that they will survive despite the attempts of the Antichrist. 
right? Despite the attempts of the false prophet, despite Satan, you know, to uh, all these attempts from these enemies to eradicate them from the earth, they'll survive as a testament to God. They'll survive as a testament to his promises. That when God makes a covenant, as he did with Israel in the Old Testament, hallelujah, he keeps it, right? He keeps it. That's our God. He always keeps his word. He always keeps his promises. Verse 31 is uh, really a testament to this. If you look at it, heaven and earth will pass away, yes. But my words, he says, will never pass away. Never. So, you know, th what does this mean? For us, do we depend on signs? No. We as believers don't have to depend on, on signs. We depend upon what? That word that never passes away. We, we depend on that unchanging word of God. Jesus will, without a doubt, fulfill his word. That's our Jesus. And so while the fig tree parable appears to apply to the tribulation, that next parable in verses 32 through 37 actually could apply directly to us. Look at it, uh, beginning in verse 32 of Mark chapter 13. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. You know, so he, he urges watchfulness. You know, he, he's saying, be ready, be ready. Are we ready? Are we ready as a church? Are you ready as a as a believer? You know, if you're you know if you're looking for Jesus' coming and you're you're waiting, you're watching, you're praying, you know, and, and you're ready. Well, my friends, I think that'll just bring holiness into your heart. You know what a blessing that is. We're to be watching and we're to be laboring. We have work to do, right? You know, you know, when is he coming? Well, no one knows. No one knows but the Father. Jesus says that. You know, that this is something that the Father knows. And, and there's probably many Christians who are living as if, you know, Jesus was never going to come. You know, but uh, we can't live like that. We need to watch. And as we watch, we work. We labor. We do that which he's called us to do. We have a great message. We have the best news of all uh, to keep giving to this world, to this community. You know, what a message. It's a message that transformed not only our lives, but it will continue to transform lives. Because what a blessed truth it is. You know, it's a message of hope. And it's a message of love. It's a message of grace. It's a message of light and life. And that's what we need. It's what we all need. And that's the work we keep carrying that gospel to the world for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of that name that's above all names. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, uh, it's, you know, we are, we're to be watching, we're to be laboring, and we're to redeem the time and make the most of what we have. That's what we're meant to do. But when is he coming? No one knows. No one knows. You know, you know this is just something the Father knows. Luke chapter 21, uh, verse 36. I need to wrap this up. I will. I will. Uh, Luke 21, verse 36. Um, reading from the Amplified again. It says, keep alert at all times. Be attentive and ready. Praying that you may have the strength and ability to be found worthy and to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand in the presence of the Son of Man at his coming. Um, we're to be watching and praying, um, you know, through the power and through the strength of the Spirit of God. We can endure persecutions. We've talked about this. We're going to suffer in some measure. 
will suffer in some extent if we follow Jesus. I don't know what that is individually, you know, for, for each of us. But there will be suffering of some kind, you know, uh, if we follow him. You know, if we follow the suffering servant, uh, we ourselves, you know, will take up that cross. You know, we'll suffer in some way. As we go through, as we labor, even as we suffer, you know, we have to be on guard ourselves against deception. And we're to what, the Bible says, we're to persevere and we're to be presented as triumphant before him, right? You know, and I know full well that this is not easy. I, I, I can't tell you that as your pastor. None of this is easy. In fact, I, I have to say, in all honesty, it's not getting any easier. Um, but Jesus says, if, if, if you're waiting for me, if you're watching for me, if you believe I'm coming, you will endure to the end. And I find that very encouraging. We can endure. And we will endure. You, you, you note that in, in everything that goes on in the world, the church is still here, right? You know? It's not going anywhere. Mark uh, wrote his gospel for uh, Gentile Romans, and like I've said this before in our studies, very, very soon they are going to face the worst persecutions that Christians have ever known. Um, and it, it must have brought them comfort to know that, you know, the greatest tribulation that would ever be, that's ever, it's never been seen since the creation of the universe, we read in the text here this morning, that Christ is able to make those who believe in him endure, even during that period of time. Praise the Lord. You know, so if he's able to strengthen them through that, the great tribulation, that second half of the, the tribulation period, then surely he'll strengthen his saints through every and any fiery ordeal that may come upon them, right? Amen. You know, Jesus is able to keep those dear people in the midst of all wrath being poured out on the earth. He's still able to do that. Incredible. You know, he's able to keep them right to the end, without stumbling and present them faultless and triumphant right there to the Father in heaven. Praise God for that. You know, there's an encouragement there for us today as well, and I'll close with that encouragement. Uh, John, Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 33. Uh, again, uh, Rebecca reading from the Amplified, John 16, 33. Jesus said, in the world, you have tribulation, and distress, and suffering. But be courageous, that is, be confident, be undaunted, be filled with joy. Why? He says, I have overcome the world. My conquest is accomplished, my victory abiding. And if, if that doesn't elicit a hallelujah from God's people, I don't know what would, right? Hallelujah. That's uh, good news. It's very encouraging for us. And, uh, you know, God is good uh, getting us through those uh, 37 <laughs> verses uh, in this amount of time. But we're grateful for it. Uh, let's go to the Lord uh, in, in prayer. Um, Lord, uh, the teaching that you uh, gave to the disciples uh, and that teaching that's really now it extends uh, to us uh, here in this time, in this day. Uh, in this in this period that we're in, uh, it's it's challenging. Uh, it's it's difficult. There's much to be curious about, uh, and there's certainly much that we could get caught up in. However, uh, you have made it clear, and I hope it's clear to us this morning, Lord, that what we can count on more than anything and depend upon more than anything are not the signs, but upon the word. Because your word is truth, your word is unshakable, it's unchanging, and we are thankful for it. Uh, we can depend upon it. We can depend upon your promises, but we can depend upon you always. Uh, heaven and earth certainly will pass away, uh, but your word never will. 
may we be those who are watchful, who are prayerful, uh, as we anticipate your coming. We don't know when, but in the time that we're given, whatever that time is, may we be bold, may we be courageous, may we be continually strengthened as we're filled with the Spirit to deliver your message to a world that desperately needs to hear it. Uh, Lord, we are carrying this message because we are people who are filled with light and we are people who are filled with love. We are people who are filled with the joy of the Lord and we seek to have people know the one whom we know and we call Savior and King and uh, we want others to know the experience of being victorious in this world. We uh, have uh, much, uh, you know, against us. The world, uh, the flesh, the devil himself, but Lord, you have not left us alone. And uh, we are so thankful for that. Uh, I thank you, Lord, for continuing to be our shield. Uh, Lord, thank you uh, for continuing to just uphold us uh, as we go forward, allowing your people to uh, have great wisdom and insight and not be deceived. Help us to be watchful. Help us to be alert so that we're not drawn away from the truth for a time, even for a short time, but to hold on, stand firm in the faith. Uh, that's what we need to do. Lord, we can only do that with you. We're, we're weak and it's hard for us. You know it is. Uh, and you know none of this is easy for us. Um, in fact, Lord, you, you look upon us and you know how hard it, it becomes for us. Thank you for, thank you for having your eyes on us. Please, Lord, hear us and hear our prayers when we cry out to you, when we when we suffer and, and sacrifice and service for you, Lord, we know that you're with us. Um, we know that we can endure. And as things uh, around us become ever more difficult, as we see tragedies around us that break our hearts, we know that you're still Lord. You always have been. You always will be. Yesterday and today and forever, you are the same. And um, I, I just, these people here this morning, Lord, fill them. Fill them with hope and fill them with courage because they serve you. Uh, may their hearts ever be for you. May they continually give all over to you. And in surrendering all, filled with the Spirit, Lord, and may they know what it is to live an abundant, eternal, and victorious life in you no matter what. May we uh, continue to do great things in your name and for the sake of the gospel. May we do all that we do as the church for your glory, for your honor. We want none of it. We want your name to be magnified so that every, every eye, everyone will see you and know that you are God. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that you are Lord. And may many come to know you and uh, know your love and let it transform their lives as it's transformed ours and continually transforms ours. Uh, there's no words that I can even <laughs> summon to thank you enough for all you are and all you mean to us. So be with your people. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.